working on these concepts for uh, probably close to a year about now. We've done a couple of different presentations, uh, beginning uh, uh, with uh, a workshop at uh, ESA. early in the year. And so uh, this one is uh, Pamela Clark helped me with uh, some of this work. And Abraham Basant is another one of our engineers who's uh, currently off in England. Um, so the concept, Pamela talked a little bit about the systems that are CubeSats. I'm going to talk about what is the kind of architecture, what are the different orbital opportunities and the ways that we can get these to the moon in different locations throughout uh, cislunar space. So here's a, a some, couple more pictures of CubeSat, so this is a three unit CubeSat, so each of these little cubes is about 10 centimeters cubed. Uh, so this is 30 centimeters long, 10 centimeters square. This is pretty much the standard uh, of care these days. This is an example uh, from Ver Vermont Technical College. He plans to fly this to the moon in the next uh, few years, and I happen to know he's got an empty 1U of mass and volume on this thing, so if anybody wants to get to the moon in the next couple of years, give this guy a call. Um, I, I offered to sell his unit, so uh, uh, somebody's going, and that's going to be one of my themes. A lot of people are going to the moon, and right now they don't have any science yet. Um, so there's going to be a lot of uh, unused capacity, and there already is a lot of unused capacity, and that's going to be part of my theme is how can we go use what's already happening out there. This is uh, Spaceflight and SpaceX. So Spaceflight is the company that's building these uh, containers. So these are launch containers. This is uh, the ESPA ring uh, on the Atlas V. It's called the ESPA ring. I forget what uh, At SpaceX calls it. But basically on Atlas class um, and, and Falcon 9 type spacecraft, they have these adapter rings. Uh, L-Cross was an ESPA ring on uh, an Atlas. And they uh, have these different containers that you can put on the side. So this is two 6U containers. Um, and then this is a 24U container. They're setting as a 12U container. So they're already talking about much larger form factors. Um, the other feature of this is um, pretty much every mission to geosynchronous orbit has hundreds of pounds, if not even 1,000 or 2,000 pounds of unused capacity in the upper stage. And so United Launch Alliance has said that they could easily get 1,000 pounds, even 2,000 pounds to L1 on capacity that they currently throw away. Uh, or if you have an upper stage disposal, it's they, their disposal route takes them right through L1, and they would be happy to have, in that case, as much as uh, um, 5,000 pounds of unused capacity. <laughs> so here's, so these, uh, another piece of this story is SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, um, Ariane, all the providers are, are hurriedly building these capacities. So we don't, um, they're waiting for the scientists. You know, we, we don't have to go out and, and create this capacity. This is an example of the astrobotic lander. So on the bottom of their lander, the, the green boxes, are, one of these has thermal control and the other one doesn't is the difference between the green and the blue, but they're both about the same size. If you added up all of that volume under there's a thousand units of volume and their typical launch mass is they, they have about a total of 200 kilograms of a landed payload. Uh, in their nominal uh, Google X Prize lander, they want about 100 kilograms for the lander and 100 kilograms for other things that could fit any. And then, you know, they'll sell you anything that fits under here. You've got to build your own containers, but that you go back to. You can bolt some of these uh, dispenser, uh, dispensers on the bottom of this container and get 100 kilograms or so either onto the surface of the moon or you can launch in orbit before you actually land, in which case you could probably have more than 200 kilograms um, actually put into different orbits, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's a, a nice chart that I, that I stole off the internet somewhere, talking about the different, um, different trajectories people are in, different ways you go. So here's you know, low Earth orbit, you go into uh, a geosynchronous phasing orbit, that's the, not the good one, let's see if this is a good one here, there we go. Uh, so you can go from 
low Earth orbit to a geosynchronous uh, GTO orbit where you're cycling between low Earth and geosync. And that's an interesting orbit if you want to do technology demonstration. If you want to uh, prove that your hardware is rad hard, um, the fact that you're cycling between uh, and through the Van Halen belts is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and as I was saying, basically with the, with the weak stability transfers, almost any, any mission to geosynchronous is almost all the way to L1, and once you get to L1, you're almost all the way to anywhere on the moon. Again, landing to, getting to the surface is hard. That's what everybody wants to do. But my suggestion is in the next five years, we could have tens of missions to cislunar space, and 10 years from now, we could have several missions to the surface. But going back to the, the Google XPRIZE folks, there's a lot of Google XPRIZE people. There's five nations all trying to get to the surface, so there could actually be quite a few lander missions as well. Um, this is an example of, of a, a weak stability transfer. So you begin in Earth orbit. In this one, you go way out here. This is out in the uh, Earth-Sun L1 direction. That's another feature. Uh, people are usually not very clear which L1 they're talking about. Um, there's, there's several of them, so hopefully we'll, we'll get people to be a little more clear. But for our purposes, all you really need to know is they're all useful. Um, any libration point is a gateway to somewhere. Um, in this context, you go way out here. Then in here, you're in this kind of everything is moving really slow relative to everything else. And so the delta V to get from here to anywhere else is really slow. And this does what's called a ballistic capture, which means if you don't really care exactly which orbit you're in around the moon, it requires zero delta V to be captured by the moon in a ballistic capture. So again, this is um, another feature of the lunar cubes is you know, making lemonade out of lemons. Uh, if you are, aren't picky about certain things, um, it can be quite easy. So a GTO, in this, from this paper, they were saying GTO is actually almost the optimal uh, exit, uh, exit strategy from the Earth to get into an orbit like this. But what you may need to do is you may need to phase for as much as a month for the moon to get in just the right place. And you know, so most people say, oh, we have 120 passengers through the Van Allen belts. Well, that's bad news. Well, if you're doing technology demonstration, one of the things you've got to do is prove that you can live through these much higher radiation fields so that this phasing period, again, could be used as something positive. Again, the long duration, it can take you. Um, Grail was a 90-day transfer. Heighton took two years. So it can take you months to years to get where you're going. <clears throat> but if you design your mission such that you're doing some science along the way, those months don't have to be wasted by any sense, in any sense of the imagination. So it's, again, taking advantage of what you have can make this very interesting. An example of the difference and the opportunity, uh, the um, part of what Pamela was talking about is we're not starting from scratch. CubeSats have been being developed for the last decade for low-Earth orbit applications, such that now the QB50 is a mission that's up and, and running and should be launched again in a couple of years. And so it's 50 CubeSats going into low-Earth orbit. And I think it's very credible to believe seven years from now, 10 years from now, we could have the Lunar 50, where we're sending 50 missions. And again, the trick is, if, you, if NASA were to do this all by itself, this is a discovery class mission for the moon. You know, it's going to cost you half a billion dollars or something if you pay for everything yourself. But this model, they built the, the core organization is building the, the container that holds the 50 CubeSats and doing the payload integration organization. But they have 30 European universities, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, many countries from around the world, Vietnam have all volunteered to build CubeSats. So for some of these very low TRL countries, it's just kind of they want to prove they can have a spacecraft. Uh, but for some of them, they're very high, uh, high quality instruments. And there will be a lot of good science done and not just um, flag planting in this mission. And I think that, again, so the, the cost gets widely distributed amongst the people who build the CubeSats. We can do something very similar in the lunar environment, say, five years from now, seven years from now. Um, a mission like this would be very viable. We've been talking about how do we bring people and keep the lunar, lunar community alive. Here they're talking about they've got you know, a, probably 1,000 people involved in this mission. Uh, so they're talking about 50 teams with 10 to 20 people each from all over the world getting orbital dynamics, ground support, experience, all of the things that go into building an, a full-up mission. One of the advantages of CubeSats is typically a small team of grad students or a professor with a few grad students um, get end-to-end -end experience. They build the hardware, they run the software, they do the science. It's um, a very holistic way of training that most lunar scientists haven't seen in 40 years.
so this is kind of the beginning idea of what might uh, the Lunar 50 mission look like. We, again, we take this U, uh, UAL uh, that gets us to L1 or L2 with, uh, say, 1,000 kilograms for almost no cost. Um, so let's assume we've got 50, 10 kilogram litter cubes. We're going to use a two by two or a two by two by three form factors. Um, then there's, I'll talk about the mass driver a little bit. This is kind of, this would be high tech. Um, but on the other hand, any credible ISRU system assumes that you're going to have a mass driver someday. So uh, if you're already in L1, getting to almost anywhere else can actually be tens of meters per second, not even 100. Um, but building a small mass driver to kick 50 satellites by a few meters per second in a couple of different directions. Um, you could populate the, ha the halo orbits, so you could do some communication arrays, non-determinist ballistic orbits. So if, again, you're doing plasma physics, you don't really care what orbit you're in as long as you know where you are. Uh, deterministic ballistic um, captures would require a little more delta V and a little more propulsion in the CubeSat itself. Uh, then you can talk about lunar ground skimming or impactor trajectories uh, to do things like magnetic surveys of soils. Thank you. Um, uh, so again, the idea is using what's readily available, we can do much more than we've been able to do in the last 40 years. Uh, and so some of these missions, again, the, the easier ones could be flown in three to five years from now. A typical CubeSat for low Earth orbit is a few hundred thousand dollars in two to three years. And that's commonly how, they, how they're going these days. As Pamela pointed out, for a lunar, probably you're talking more like a million dollars in three to five years, but that's a lot better than the last 40 years have been able to provide. So here's the, the, the last piece, which is kind of the, the gee whiz that, that got, uh, uh, gets people's attention. But this is, uh, so Advanced Magnet Lab is one of our partners in Florida. This is some research they did um, they were trying to launch a small sat, so this is a couple of kilograms, to low Earth orbit from the ground. So they uh, built this launcher. It's not entirely clear to me how big the actual launcher would be. They were trying to get to Mach 27 on the ground and just kick this thing up into orbit. But what they proved was that this um, geometry is magnetically stable, which is new. Uh, uh, magnetic railguns are not dynamically stable. Um, and therefore, they require a lot of fancy stuff to make them stable, and often they never are. Uh, but they had this uh, double helix technology, which is a very cool uh, new way of doing magnetic windings in this, in this integrated manufacturing facility where they can create essentially any magnetic field you want, quadrupole, multipole, any geometry of magnetic field. They can just kind of paint the, the coils onto these surfaces, um, and they can be linear, rec uh, curvilinear any number of, of ways. So this is kind of cool technology. I just wanted to introduce that. Um, and incredibly building a small mass driver to just kind of kick these things out into various directions. The idea is simply the moon is much closer than it used to be. There are a lot of people going very close to the moon and getting lots of different small missions to different locations is, is a very credible thing to be doing five years from now, seven years from now. And right now, after a decade of CubeSats, there are over 200 CubeSat missions on the books now. I think it's very credible to believe 10 years from now we could have 50, 100 lunar missions under development and many of them flying. Thank you very much. The one last slide. We bring it back up. Should I wait for your last slide or after? Uh, no, go ahead and ask the question while he's bringing it up. Can you bring my slides back, please? It's very interesting stuff, very exciting to hear about um, the potential uh, of international, large international participation. By the same token, there are international recommendations about emissions uh, over the far side, and we've heard about science that can be done from the far side, particularly from the standpoint of astronomy. I'm starting to get a bit worried about whether we're going to have this cloud of lunar cubes or CubeSats uh, radiating away, always in view of the far side, and essentially polluting ourselves out of this natural resource. And I wonder if there's any long-term strategy to make sure we don't pollute the far side, which is a natural resource. Thank you for that. And that's why we are trying to build a standard. One of the standards is not only a standard for extending the bus to cislunar applications, but also the uses, um, because almost all of these things are going to impact on the moon somewhere. And so, yeah, you don't want people going willy-nilly and flying these things without a little bit of thought. 
On the other hand, um, people are going to be flying these things, and so the U.S. isn't the only game in town. So uh, to that, we're creating a series of workshops to begin having that conversation and that discussion. And so I invite everybody. I've got some flyers if anybody would like a little more information about the workshop series. Uh, we're going to do some one-day uh, intros, and then a finally a full-up uh, workshops will begin next year. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the ballistic capture uh, orbit, which sounded like it didn't require much propulsion, which I don't understand. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, so what happens is uh, if you take that really long